Those are the kind of questions. Oh, come on. you got to ask those kind of questions. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. What's it exposed? What's it see? What do you see now that you didn't see before? Let's go to Samuel. Where is Samuel? It's before Kings, right? There it is, 2 Samuel, and chapter 15. 2 Samuel 15. Joe's yawning already. I, I get it, brother. You've been awake for, what, 25, 30 minutes? And that's rough, isn't it? I mean, it's hard. He's getting to be... It happens in our house. It happened to both our dogs. You know, they, they're up for an hour. Baby just can't handle it. And uh, Ryrie's entitled this Absalom's Revolt. I entitle it The Rise of the Antichrist um, or The Fall of Satan. They're both involved in this section here uh, of what takes place. Um, oh, there's, I, I really am in a quandary. I'm a straight betwixt two. <laughs> Not to live or die. I mean, I get, don't get your hopes up. Um, but it's to to just read through it. Some of you probably haven't read Second Samuel since your reading pro program. Some of you maybe haven't read it before. Um, and, and just get to know the story of what happens here and throw in some uh, application stuff. And that, that kind of light stuff is good for us. It's nice. Or to just kind of dive right in and spend the next year. <laughs> it's... it's there is a lot here, all right? And I made inference to it, so, so I like to do that, and, and I don't know if it interests you. I don't know how interested you are. Um, I, would, I would tell you, um, get very interested in what God's interested in, all right? And the Antichrist and the fall of Satan is told to us about 20 different times in the Bible. That's a lot, Okay, uh, the person of the Antichrist or the false prophets brought up over and over and over again in many different ways. When we're searching our Bible in the Old Testament, we're searching for the seed of the woman in contrast to the seed of the serpent. So, so we're not trying to find Satan everywhere and see him behind every bush. That's not a good idea. Um, but find Christ. But you also can find Antichrist, and he's everything the opposite of what Christ is. And understand our Bible's primary concern is with that, the exposing of Christ, the exposing of Antichrist. If you know Antichrist, you, 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 you know the lies of Satan, and you don't fall prey to it. Over and over and over in our Bible, we find the lies of Satan. And uh, um, let me just show you one thing. Go to Psalms 10. Psalm. I'm sorry, Castle. Psalm 10. It's, you can't say Psalms 10. Okay, that's plural, singular. It doesn't make sense. I could say Psalms 10 and 11, but Psalm 10. Psalm 10. And we'll flip back there in a minute. Now, we could preach the sermon on Psalm 10. I thought about doing it tonight um, because Psalm 10 is great. But let's just read it. It's not long. It's 18 verses. And uh, tell me who it's talking about. Okay. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thyself in the times of trouble? Now, here is a theme verse, okay? Uh, let me give you a hint who's speaking here. This is Israel during the tribulation. That ought to give it all away, amen? But this is a question that, this, that, that could, now there's, how many questions are here? There's two. What are the two questions? What are the premise of the two questions? Are they true or false? And why does it seem to be that way? Why does God stand far off? Is he? Does the Bible declare that God is close or near? <laughs> oh, come on, Christians. Does the, God, the Bible declare that God is close or near? He's near. In him we live and breathe and have our being. He is near to every one of us. Where can God go that is not near you? So what is this question, why standest thou far off? What's it mean to stand far off? If somebody's standing far off, right? You're being, you're being mugged, and, and the police is over there, but they're standing far off. Right? They're not helping. <laughs> they're not helping, right? That's, right? That's, I like the one guy who, who they, they were commenting on that a long, years ago, the guy that got beat up like by five policemen, and they got their sticks out, that black guy, they beat him. Who? King, yeah, years ago. And, uh, and some, some guy was watching that, and the news guy goes, if that ever happens to me, put down your camera and come help me. <laughs> I thought, well, that was pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> if they're beating me. Okay, snap a picture. Thank you. Now come help me. And uh, Why hidest thou in the times of trouble? Why does God hide? Does God hide? And if he does, why does he? 
If he doesn't, why does he think he is? And these are the questions that come automatic. So this is the premise of this psalm. Now we come in, it says, the wicked. Uh, verse 2, the wicked. And I'm just going to say, the, the, the wicked. I'm just, just going to stay there for a minute. The wicked. And in verse 3, it says, for the wicked. And th then in verse 4, it says, the wicked. Who's the wicked? Kessel says Satan. Who's with him? Sharon? We are. Who knew that? Uh, does she have a choice? <laughs> anybody for anybody else? Joe says, not there with that. The Antichrist? Is that a symbol? It's a gang symbol, isn't it? And uh, when you say something, she thinks the Antichrist. Antichrist or Satan? Or is it just wicked people? How do you read it? The Bible says, uh, in the New Testament, it says, that wicked one. And the wicked is capitalized. He's the wicked one. He is the wicked one. And when it says here, this is a direct reference to the Antichrist filled with Satan. So who's right? Which castle? Right? Right? It's Judas filled with Satan. Which one's right? Okay? The wicked. So this is a, this is a psalm about the Antichrist. This tells you how he thinks and why he does what he does. All right. Now, Absalom is one of the greatest pictures in our Bible of the fall of Satan and the Antichrist heart. Satan's heart, Antichrist heart, same thing. You know, it's like saying Christ God, you know, the idea there. Um, it's, it's not a good simile, uh, but not a good comparison. Um, the wicked in his pride. So what's Absalom's problem? Doth persecute the poor. Who's the poor in the Bible? Christians. Saved people, right. God's family are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Who are the poor? Who's the poor of the flock in Zechariah chapter 11 that know God? Who are the poor of the flock? Kessel's like, me! It's, this is not monetary poverty. Okay? When God refers to the poor, we know that poverty physically, monetarily, is a representation of the poor in spirit. And we want to get, what does God say about the rich, right? Yes, there's a problem, right? Riches are never good. But when God's talking about it, he's not talking so much monetarily, right? The rich and the poor meet together. Who are they? Um, the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Who's he persecuting? Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. Boy, that takes us to Zechariah. God abhorbs them and they abhor the Lord. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Hmm, who is? Huh, who is in his thoughts if God's not? That's a good question, isn't it? Kessel says it's self-centered. Is he narcissistic? Does he make a huge tower and put his name on it? <laughs> Come on, that's funny. <laughs> I mean, that is funny. And uh, uh, His ways are always grievous. Always, always. They're never not. Thy judgments are far out of his sight. What does that mean? For all of his enemies, he puffeth at them. Hmm. Who are the enemies of mankind? that they puff at. Isn't it funny how you just ask questions and all of a sudden you're like, yeah? And the last enemy, 1 Corinthians 15. He has said in his heart, wait a minute, God knows what the Antichrist says in his heart. He knows what the, the wicked thinks in his heart. I shall not be moved, for I shall never see, I never be in adversity. Okay, which one of the devil's lies is that? There's no judgment for sin. I can sin with impunity. Went through that through Sunday school this morning. I can sin. Second sin, the second lie, is that what you said? <laughs> one of the five, you go with that. Uh, I don't think there's any particular order except the first one. What's we think? He thinks, I can sin with impunity. I shall never come into judgment. Who's going to call me into judgment for what I've done? Huh? I had a guy one time, he was, he, he was yelling at us, and he walked outside and lifted up his hand and made a filthy gesture and said, 
their God. And he turned and said, ha, where's your God? All right. He never thinks they'll be called into a judgment for what they've done. I will never be in adversity. I will never. I shall never be in adversity. I shall not be moved. She sitteth and, and filleth her mouth and saith, I am. Who would say that? His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. Now, what I want you right now is retreat a little bit. We're focusing on Absalom. This is Absalom. This is who Absalom is. He's not an innocent kid gone awry. He's wicked in his heart, in the depths of his heart. What produced that wickedness? We could, we could discuss that. Um, he's sitting in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. Everything he is is sneaky and mischievous and, and deceiving. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth them into his net. He croucheth and humbleth himself, that the poor may fall by his strong ones. This reminds me of uh, that, that movie they made about the dinosaurs, Jurassic Park. And, uh, and they, uh, they showed that the, the one velociraptor there, and he gets him in his gun sight. He's going to shoot him. And he, the velociraptor kind of turns and looks at him. That's when he looks sideways and sees the other one about to attack him. And he says, you sneaky, and he swears. And he realized that the, the, the one velociraptor comes out and pretends to draw your attention so the other ones can attack you because they're pack hunters. And he didn't realize that until that moment. And then he died. That's the picture here. The Antichrist moves, humbles himself, and before he comes down, why? So you're focusing on him when you get attacked from his strong ones. Now, if, if, if that word, his strong ones, if you know anything about history, that is Nimrod. And Nimrod's strong ones or winged ones or his centurions, the half horsemen, half men um, that would come, that came over. His, if you know anything about history, his strong ones, where he was known for, says, this is Nimrod all over again. Nimrod, great picture of the Antichrist, one of the first ones in our Bible. Um, fortified a city. Why? Because he knew God was about to attack. He built a tower. Now, a tower in the Bible is not a tower to reach to heaven. It's a tower to defend against heaven. That's what towers are. Thou art my tower. Thou art my strong point. Thou art, thou art my fortification. That is what I'm going to trust in. Why did they make the bricks so hard? Some say so it could go so high, or was it to defend against an attack? What did they know God was about to do? Attack. What were they expecting? What were they going to do? What was Nimrod defending against? Him? Why was he against the Lord? Was it, that's him, or his strong ones. He saith in his heart, God hath forgotten, he hideth his face, he'll never see. What's the attack? What's the lie? God doesn't care? There's, there's, there's got to be an answer why God doesn't do anything about sin. Why didn't God stop that gun from going off? He could have just done it, right? Put a dead bullet inside that one chamber. It's happened. There's been duds. Why not that bullet? Why doesn't God intervene into sin? There's got to be an answer. Well, let me tell you the answer. It's either because he doesn't know how, or he doesn't care, or he can't. He's either not strong enough, not smart enough, or um, he doesn't realize it. God has forgotten. Isn't that, that's the only three answers could be, right? Because he's not doing anything about it. See what I just did? Anybody know what that is? There's a name for that. When you, when you pin somebody down to three or two answers, and there's obviously more. So that what you do is by doing that, you disguise the true answer. Huh? Yes or no? Maybe. <laughs> right. um, he hath forgotten. He hideth his face. You'll never see it. God can be defeated. It's one of the devil's lies. What, would, what happens? He, he'll, he forces him to turn away his face. Arise, O Lord, O God. Lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked contempt God? That's to hold in contempt. He hath said in his heart, thou will not require it. No requirement for sin. No requirement for my actions. No, no judgment day. Why do, why do they not believe in hell? Why do the majority of churches no longer believe in hell? Just had a call last night. Guy talking to a brother in Christ. And he said that he believes that 
the lake of fire, he said, is like a second death. I said, yeah, that's that's true. He's good. So hell's not the same as lake of fire. And we straightened that out in his theology. He goes, okay, I got it. He says, but he said, when they go into the lake of fire, they cease to exist. They're annihilated. He didn't use annihilate. I said, that's called annihilationism. And that's that would make God the most wicked creature that ever lived. To annihilate a free will being is complete, absolute wickedness. And uh, um, so we went through the idea that, that why do churches believe in annihilation? They can't be in hell forever. Why can't they be in hell forever? You know, the, the, the subtle belief, and I, I answered him this, I said, here's the problem. You believe in purgatory in your heart. He said, no. I said, yes. I said, because you believe that hell would lead to repentance. But let me show you what happens to people who are in hell. You ever see somebody hit their finger with a hammer? An ungodly, wicked man? Does he repent from pain? What does he do? He curses God. What are you going to hear in hell? The reason you can't imagine hell as eternal because you can't imagine sin as eternal. They are going to keep cursing God for eternity. They will never repent, and hell will never bring out repentance. It will only bring out cursing. But because you believe in purgatory secretly in your heart, you can't believe hell is forever because at some point they paid for their sin. Well, yeah, they may have paid for their sin they did on earth. Soon as you get that, you start answering questions. You find the secret in the person's heart. What is it? It's a believing in a lie, right? What's the lie there, right? Hell should lead to repentance, and therefore they deserve to get out. Where are you? Luke chapter 16. What's the guy in hell say? His, what's he's inferring by giving me that drop of water is I'm not here justly. Hell is not fair if they're there forever. God is unjust. That, everything goes back to the wickedness of God. And, uh, and I don't know if we can grasp. If you can grab the lies of Satan, you're going to help people. So, and you're going to understand why people cast off truth. What does the Bible say? Sound doctrine is what? They will not blank sound doctrine. Why does it take endurance? Endurance has the inference of strength and holding up under pressure. Why does it take pressure and strength for, to have sound doctrine? Because it's hard to understand? No. What's the strength that's needed? And so we'll stop there for a while. Okay, we've only got a little bit to reread. Uh, for thou hast seen it, for thou beholdest mischief and spite to requit it at thy hand. The poor committeth himself to thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Who is that? Who, by the way, whose arms get shriveled? Who has one arm and one eye? Seek out his wickedness till thou found none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of thy land. Anybody know what's, what he's, what's he talking about there? The judgment of nations, right? The return of Jesus Christ as king, and what's he do? He judges the nation. The goats go to one side. The sheep go to the other. The goats are cast into hell. The sheep enter the millennial reign. He purges his land. It's an it's amazing thing, right? Uh, the Lord has heard the desire of the humble. Thou will, thou will prepare his heart. Thou will cause his heart to hear. Humility leads to salvation. That's an amazing. How many know that's true? Yes. God causes the ear or the heart to hear of the humble. That's an amazing thing. To judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. Who's the man of the earth? That's one of the names of the Antichrist. He's the man of the earth. Right? Or, or is that referring to the false prophet who comes up out of the earth, where the Antichrist comes out of the sea? Awesome. This is what your Bible's about. So when you read that, don't just think of wicked people. You can, because they take after the Antichrist. They believe, in mystery of iniquity doth already work. There's wicked people out there believing the lies of Satan, propelling the lies of Satan, and living with the lies of Satan. Why? So they can fulfill their own lust. Why do you want to get rid of hell? So that way there's no judgment. Why do you want no God so there's no judgment? Why do you want no judgment so I can sin? I want to sin with impunity. I want to do anything I want and never have to pay for it. That's what I want with all my heart. So therefore, I cast off God and don't keep him in my thoughts. And I say there is no God, and I'll never be called to judgment for what I do. Right? If you don't get caught, it's not illegal. Right? How I many you know that's not true? It, it probably would be true, except for the omnipresence of God causes a problem with the not get caught part. 
Psalm, uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel 15. This is Absalom in his heart. He's the Antichrist. He's Satan and, and the fall of Satan. And what we read tonight is about trafficking, okay, and what he does to traffic his lies. Can you catch the lies of, of Absalom, the lies about the kingdom and what he does? The, the, and then you got to catch the, 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 the political genius of him, okay? Why? Because this is the rise, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 12, of the rise of the, or 8, the rise of the Antichrist and his political savvy. Amazing politician, like something we've never seen before. Okay, um, it says that that and it came to pass, and, and that's always a good thing, amen. All right, whatever is happening right now, it's come to pass. The reason it's here is to go away. Right, we're progressives, you know that, right? Right, we, we believe it's going to pass. <laughs> amen. amen. Something better is coming. Amen. Yeah, amen. Uh, and it came to pass after this, the Absalom prepared him chariots and horses. And 50 men to run before him. <laughs> now, this is a common thing is it with, the, with the king's sons. It wouldn't be too unusual. We've seen stuff like this before. And now you've got 50 men running before you. <clears throat> An indication of your nobility. People see you coming. It would be odd today, but we, we see similar acts in the political world here. I want you to notice something, though. Absalom has begged to get back into the courtroom. As soon as he steps into the courtroom of David... He desires the throne. So what do you have? Right? What do you have? No place is good enough for the wicked. Rise them up, they want to go higher. Rise them up, they want to go higher. This is Satan's desire, right? Number two creature, or I'm sorry, number one creature, under God only. Right? He said his spread covered the whole throne of God. And he wasn't content with that. He wanted to go higher. There's only one step higher. That's, that's the, the throne of God. That's the only place Satan could go that was higher than him. So that's what he desired. Your desire to be more than you are is from hell. Not better than you are. We understand that. To improve yourself. You want to get in shape? Get in shape. Right? Right, Joe? Oh, strong. Mighty. All right? You want to change something about yourself? You know, you want to get educated? Get a class. Go take a college class. Get educated. You know, do that kind of stuff, right? I mean, that's great. We're not talking about that, that discontentment with, you know, I want to know my Bible better. Well, that's a good thing, you know. I'm talking about being more than human. I only need six hours sleep. Oh, you guys stop that. There's no heroic thing to needing less sleep. God made you human. The human needs seven to eight hours of sleep a night. A teenager needs a little more, eight to ten. To be healthy, you're six hours of sleep a night for 30 years, you're going to die ten years younger than you should. Well done. <laughs> right? <laughs> you just increase the aging process manifold. The body only heals at rest. Right, Steve? You know that. And... Well, congratulations. You cut your body's healing process down by two hours for the last 30 years. Well done. How do you feel? Oh, I don't know why I hurt. I know why you hurt. Because you're an arrogant young man. And you're so, <laughs> I only need, you know. Then you get the lazy young man. Well, the pastor said, i got to sleep eight hours. You've been in bed for 12, okay? And, uh, <laughs> no. and it came to pass, amen. The Absalom prepared him 50 chariots, prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men, not 50 chariots, to run before him. Or else the chariots were run over the man, they'd be ugly. And Absalom rose up early. What do you see about Absalom? How's his character? Right. It, character and godliness do not equate. We went through this, I think, I don't know, talking about it sometime. Never equate the two. If you do, you fall into Puritanism. Okay, and Puritanism had a lot of good things. It's the pilgrims that came, a lot of good things going for it, a lot of godliness involved there. You know, amen. A lot of good stuff, right? And some of the old Puritan writers, woo, read some of them, man. You want to crawl into your bed and just feel like you're, oh my goodness, the godly men and godly women. Holy cow, you know. And I mean, they lived convictions that me and you would be like, wow. But what was the error that they that of Puritanism? Right. And uh, um, is that if you don't have character, then you can't be saved. 
And Jesus said, no, 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 you don't understand. Prostitutes and harlots and, 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 uh, and vile men are coming in before you guys. You, you think these people who were the, the publicans didn't have good discipline? Because the, the Romans always hired people who were useless, right? No. The Romans hired people who were brilliant. You saw the movie, right? And uh, So they were men of strong discipline and good character and smart people, and they're, they're wicked, okay? And uh, if you take a wicked person and educate him highly, you have a highly educated wicked person, right? He will steal much more efficiently. He'll have a white-collar crime instead of blue. Congratulations on what you've done, right? Uh, if you get him really high educated, he'll be a politician. <laughs> you know they all have graduated from Ivy League schools. They've all done good in college. You know, most of them have law degrees, almost all of them. We couldn't match them toe to toe with brain power, not even come close to most of our politicians. But they're ungodly bunch for the most part, aren't they? Don't equate the two. And don't think just because somebody has no character that they're ungodly, right? That they're not saved, okay? Is character and godliness better? Yes. Put the two together, what do you have? You have some of the finest and greatest preachers that ever walked our land. You have Whitfield. You have some men that change continents. Why? Because they combine character with godliness. Right? I don't care how godly you are. If you have no character, you're not going to do much for God. You're going to go to heaven. And you might get some other people in heaven. Praise the Lord. But you're not going to be a mover and shaker in this world for God. Okay? You're never going to be a Daniel. Daniel had extreme character. Study it. Right? And a, a man of severe discipline. Right? Three times a day, no matter what, he went to pray. We can't get once a month. <laughs> right? We, it's hard to get our prayer day in. And uh, extreme. So he rose up early. We, we want, you want to see this. He thinks he's going to get away with sin. His pride was the beginning of his downfall, according to Psalm chapter 10. The pride of his countenance would not allow him to acknowledge God. The pride, uh, uh, twice there in Psalm, it told you of the origin, the origin, the origin of evil and wickedness in the Antichrist heart is in Psalm, uh, why am I in Proverbs? Uh, Psalm 10 that we read. I just want to just refresh your memory. It said this. It said, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire. I'm sorry, not that one. Um, the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. In his pride leads him. Right? The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. So, what, what was Satan's sin? Angela knows. Anybody else know? What was the sin of Satan? Pride. Pride. Everybody say pride. Pride. Okay, now don't say it no more. Let's erase that from our vocabulary. Let's be biblical people. All right? If you say to your kids, I'm proud of you, I'm not going to get down your throat. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm just going to look at you and go, you're stupid. Um, <laughs> I won't do that. I won't do that. And maybe some of you do, and I know what you mean by you trying to do a good thing. But you're not, you're not biblical. Pride is wicked in every shape and form. There is no such thing as a good pride. It's horrible. God warns us every time pride is mentioned, it's wicked. The pride of thine heart has deceived thee, God says, that thou dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, who saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? I mean, the pride is, is Satan's sin. It says, not a novice, lest he be lifted up with pride and fall into the condemnation of the devil. God says, don't put a novice in the pulpit or in a position of power. Why? Because pride will get to him. What? And then he'll, he'll fall into what? The condemnation of the devil. Pride is horrible. It's terrible. It leads to every kind of sin there is. And it causes you to cast off God from your mind. Pride is absolutely the lifting up of the heart. And uh, I heard a preacher one time say, God is proud of you. He said it to his pulpit. From his pulpit. I looked. I know what he's saying. I know he's a good man. He's trying to do right. He's, he's probably, I, I would say, he's a, I know he's a better man than I. But that statement was wrong. How dare you put pride in God? Are you kidding me? God is proud? Are you kidding me? You would say that? The sin of Satan is found in the heart of God? Do you understand what you just said? 
God is proud? Are you crazy? Is the Holy Spirit telling you to tell somebody you're proud of them? Really? So the Holy Spirit's leading you to say, I am proud? Proud? I have the sin of Satan in my heart for you. What should you say to them? Get out, to Satan. Get behind me, right? <laughs> it's about time God's people stop. How did Jim Benny say it? Uh, justifying their sin with the words of the world and start condemning their sin with the words of God. Because that's what psychology does. It just justifies sin. I'm proud. No, you're not. You're wicked. If you're proud, you're wicked. Matter of fact, that's the wicked one. Are you proud of me? No? Okay, good. All right. All right. Proud to be an American. Well, at least I know I'm free. I Listen, I know what they're trying to say. Right? So I changed the word. Thank God I'm an American. Well, at least I know I'm free. All right? Praise the Lord for freedom and praise the Lord for America and praise the Lord for a country that stands out. The major principle is freedom. It's our number one Bill of Rights is freedom in three areas. Praise the Lord for freedom. Let's defend it. Let's stand up to it. Let's fight for it. Thank God for freedom. But I ain't proud. Why? Because I know what pride is and I do find it in there sometimes and it's wicked and dark. It's from my old nature. And I don't like it. Absalom's pride rises up. So he gets 50 men in chariots to run before him. Well, that's not arrogant. <laughs> think he's proud? All right. I'm reestablished as a king's son. Now I want the throne. So he devises a plan. Now the heart of Absalom's plan was here originally. We find that out in the text. It's awesome. Why? By a textual variant that's, that's obviously an error in Scripture. Ryrie says so. He's got to be right. It's a study Bible. It's awesome, right? Verse 2, and Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. Wow. He's not lazy. He's puffed up, right? And uh, he thinks he's going to get away with sin. So he gets up and he gets, into the, he gets himself in the way, in the place, in the place, crying out to passengers as they go by. <laughs> Where am I? Who stands in the way of the concourse crying out to passengers as they go by? Stolen waters are sweet. Bread eating is secret is pleasant. Yes, we want it. we're in Proverbs chapter 9 now, right? Two women and one on each side of the, of the road calling out to the passerbys. Everybody's calling out to those passing by. Who are the people passing by and who are the two women calling out? Why are they always calling out to the passengers? Why do they want people to follow them? We studied that Saturday morning. Uh, having men's persons in admiration for advantage. That when any man had a controversy, so, so there's a problem. He's got a controversy usually with another man. There's things going on. Came to the king for judgment. Then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? Why does he care? Why does he ask that question? <laughs> and they said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. How many tribes of Israel? No. Ten. What are the other two? What's the king of? King David. Judah. Right? King, he's from Judah. He reigned in Hebron first. The tribes didn't accept him. Right? Uh, who rose up and was made king over there? We studied in David's life. Saul's son. Got it? Ish? Isbosheth. Yes, the name you can't say. Rose, who made him king? Who was his right-hand man that made him strong? He was murdered by jo Joab. Because with an A. Abishai. Just a cool name, right? Or was it Abner? <laughs> no, Abishai. Right. And Abishai, they came to make a deal, and, and, and he gets murdered by, by Joab, right? So we, we know... There's a split in the kingdom. There always has. Judah and Benjamin and the ten tribes of Israel never get along. They never get along very good. Anybody know a country like that? It's called America, north and south, right? And they still don't get along that good, right? And there was a split in the kingdom before. We know what's going to happen with Solomon's son. They're going to split again, right? And what's going to be? Ten and two. The, the, between Judah 
and, and, and the Benjamites and Judah, those two tribes, and the rest of the ten tribes of Israel, there's always going to be, there always was, until after the, tri the kept Babylonian captivity. That ended that. But uh, just as Jeremiah said it was with two sticks. But up until then, there's always been a split. They've never accepted it fully. And Absalom knows. Hey, what are you from? Oh, we're one of the ten tribes of Israel. Oh, come here. We're from Judah. All right, pass on. See, he knows who he's going after. This is why the question would say, why does he care where they're from? Hey, what city are you from? I'm the king's son. Got my 50 men. Got my chariot parked over here. All right, so now, so what's he do? Now, what he does is called trafficking or merchandising, and this is what Satan did to the angels. And this is how Satan took a third of the angels. So, um... So this is, this is the picture. This is how it happened. All right, We'll just leave it there. We can go on to that a little bit. But anyway, Absalom said unto him, verse 3, See, thy matters are good and right. <laughs> how does the Antichrist rise to power? Through flatteries, the Bible says, right? Thy, the, thy, thy, you know, thy matters are good and right. Amen. He's going to go after them, right? Deuteronomy 17, 16. We look at it. He pretends concern for the people. He's a politician. Not only that, he's of the People's Party. He's a Democrat. For, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> absolutely, he's of the people, and he's concerned for the people and their personal matters. He's of the grassroots movement. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and, and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Huh. He becomes a politician. Amazing. Amazing place where he steps up into, exalts himself into this position of the people's man. I'm the people's man. I'm the people's man. I'm for you. These are good and right. And man, and oh, if, if, if there was a judge, and but God, the king hasn't made nobody to take care of these things. What's the difference here? The king won't take care of it. If you go past this gate and into that, into that palace, nothing's going to happen. It's impossible to get change in America. You enter into that swamp, you ain't going to change anything. You go into there, it's nothing but politics. You're going to talk. Nothing's going to happen. You know, it wouldn't it be nice if there was just somebody on the outside who knew the people. And, and he, could, he could judge for you and, and really knew what was going on. I'd be a people's man. And, but if the king would just deputize somebody to, to do this, place somebody in this office, uh, it would be so good because if you go into that place, Oh, that there was a judge. Look what he says. Verse number four. And Absalom, uh, and Absalom said, moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land. Was he judged for what he did? He that escapes judgment wants to be a judge. He that receives no judgment doesn't believe in any judgment. I'll never stand for what I do wrong. In his heart, he's saying, I'll never stand for what I did wrong. I'll never pay for what I've done. Oh, that I were a judge. Oh, I'd make that person pay who wronged you. Oh, you better believe it. <laughs> oh, I love it, right? <laughs> oh, the politician is so ungodly wicked. He only will say what he wants the people to hear. He's a populist man. He's going after the, the polls are leading in which direction he's going to make his decisions. He's going to get into office this way. 2 Peter 2.10. Oh, that I were a judge in the land, that every man which had any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. Wow. You know, Absalom, to know how to rule, you must know how to follow. A lot of people have aspired to be rulers, but they never learned figured out how to follow. It's never going to work out good for him. And it was so that when any man came nigh unto him, to do to him a, 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 a obese, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. Ooh, the king's son. Bow, bow before the king's son. Oh, no, 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 don't bow before me. Here, rise. Oh, oh, my brother. Don't bow before me. I'm just one of you. I'm just one of you. I'm doing one of the D. Pelotonios. Or Kessel's grin. Makes you think he's about to kill you. What? That's what I said. I do with Brother De Filippo Antonio, yeah. And uh, 
And so that's this is that, and he no 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 don't 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 no no. Oh yeah yeah. He, he notice the populist movement. Okay, uh, does it work? Yeah, it works terrific, right? Psalm one, Psalm ten, nine nine through ten. Read that what, what we just read there. Psalm ten nine through ten, and see where he kissed him, right? And what he does to him. What's in his heart? He hates him. He hates him with a passion. He does hate the poor. He's lying in wait for them. What does it say in Psalm 9 and 10? It said, he humbles himself before them. Why? So they might get taken by his wicked ones, his strong ones. All right? It's fade. It's pretend. It's fake. Do you believe these politicians? Do you believe anything they're saying? Now, there's some good people in Washington. There is. And there's some good people in Harrisburg. There are. There's some saved people there. I met them. We went there soul winter, right, Kessel? And, uh, um, and, and there are. There's staffies that are saved. And by the way, our whole government is run by what, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds? Yeah, the whole government's run by that, you know, staffies. They run the government. Uh, um, and so pray for, <laughs> for our government. No, you want to know what's wrong? Um, so that's, it's fake. They're, they're coming out. Why? Why? They're, they're, there's $400 billion missing from the pandemic relief fund. Where do you think it went? There was four idiots who stole somewhere in the area of $80 billion, and they went out and bought million-dollar cars, half-million-dollar cars. Do you think the neighbors didn't notice? If you pulled in and there's a Bugatti sitting out here, it's a million-dollar car, fastest car in the world. You know I'm smiling if there's a Bugatti in the driveway, right? And you see me come pulling around here in a million-dollar car. Are you going to be suspicious? No? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> What's that? You didn't get it from here. I didn't get it from there. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I get three months. Right. I just say, well, you know, I, we took the ties and offering to sail and make it and hit it big. And uh, <laughs> I mean, why would you do that? I mean, you think you're going to get away with that? One of them had this uh, 400000 or $400 million Ferrari. I'm like, oh. No, it was a four hundred million. How much? I can't remember. It was two three hundred eighty million or some dollar car. I mean, you think you're going to get away with this? You're you're a secretary. <laughs> Hello. Anyway, why do politicians kiss babies? Because there's eighty or four hundred billion dollars missing. Why do politicians shake hands? Why do politicians get up early and travel all over America? Why? Because there's four hundred billion dollars missing. Billion with a B. Thievery like it's never been seen before on earth. Ever. Ever. How much is enough? How about these old oligarchs from Russia? Half a billion dollar boat with a crew of 50. A captain making $200,000 a year. You're paying for it. And he's on his boat. Now that... That's a boat, baby. I mean, we sanctioned them, took away their boats. Poor people. That's what politics is about, right? It's not about loving people and loving your country. Love. It's not about that. That's a statesman. They wouldn't get elected today. A statesman stands on what he believes. He doesn't care what the polls say. This is who I am. If you want me, elect me. If you don't, that's fine. But this is who I am. That's a statesman. We used to have some in America. We used to have some. Uh, the days of the statesmen are gone. Fox News keeps saying, well, 80% of America believes in this, or 60% of America believes in this, so it must be true. If you, if you ever hear that on the news, do you know what logical fallacy it is and how stupid it is to say something like that? Do you know our news reporters are falling into Hollywood? They're almost as stupid as the Hollywood actors. They're wearing just as much makeup. You ever wonder what, what they'd look like on the news, Brett Breyer would look like without makeup on? <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. He kissed him. Oh, don't bow to me. I'm just one of you. Uh, no, you're not. You're the king's son. No, you're not. When's the last time you had a job? Don't tell me you're one of me. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Notice it worked. It worked. It worked. And it worked well. Um, 
Psalm 62 I have written in here at this point in time is where Psalm uh, 62 comes in. Um, but you can jot that. Did you have Psalm 62 in your chronological Bible? Yeah. And uh, um, let me just read this. Go ahead and turn to Psalm 62. We'll read through it. Yes, sir. It was Abner. I was right. Abishai's the other guy. Oh, yes. I was doubting it, but I, I doubted it. I was like, no, it's Abishai. When you say Abishai, I said, oh, yeah, it's Abishai. It was Abner. Abishai was Joab's right hand man. That was Joab's brother. And his and uh, Ash, uh, 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 his other brother. Esahel, who got killed. And ch he chased after Abner. Yeah, because I preached a message, don't be an Abner. I couldn't remember why. That's why. Thank you, Kesselhoff. You are a good man. I take back what I said about you earlier. Psalm 62 was written at, around this time. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. Uh, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you imagine mischief against a man? Shall he be, uh, Ye shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall. Shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. This is David uh, later writing this psalm in light of this time of his life and what was happening behind his back by his son and the, and the rebellion that was taking place. And they only con consult to cast him down from his excellency. Now, David, we know, is talking about himself. The only reason they're talking is they're casting him down from his excellency. They're here to, to talk bad about the king. We know this goes into God and in Jesus Christ. Um, uh, Satan and the angels. Um, they delight in lies. They bless with their mouths, but they curse inwardly. Now, what did the Bible say over there in Psalm 10 about the, the wicked one? His mouth is full of cursing, right? That's what they are. With their mouth, they're blessing, but they're cursing you on the inside, and they're cursing God on the inside. Selah. My soul, my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Amen. That is good advice. What's that called? Single-mindedness. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. If thy eye be single. Only upon God and God alone. Um, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. I shall not be. I shall not be moved. Woohoo! Page 388 in your songbook. Right? <laughs> Amen. And God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Uh, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. Amen. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. God has spoken once, twice, yea, I have heard this, that power belongeth to God. <laughs> oh, I like that verse. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy. For thou renderest to every man according to his work. Uh, as he looks back at, and realizes what was happening at this time in his life and what happened. It says in verse number 7, back in um, 2 Samuel 15, it says, um, And it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom, 40 years? Brother Ryrie, he is our brother in Christ, says, <coughs> 40 years. Probably a copyist error. And should read four years. Along with the Septuagint, he just writes LXX, Syriac, uh, and the Syriac, and the writings of Josephus. The period probably began with Absalom's return from Gusher. So you think it's, a, it's an error? Probably a mistake, right? Probably a copyist error. I mean, the guy, I mean, there's two other, the old Syriac is a good version of the Bible. And the Septuagint's used quite a bit. The LXX it's used quite a bit, but you know, if you read the Septuagint itself, there's there's a full of errors. But but it's used quite a bit. And both those two say four years. The Syriac's a powerful one. Syriac's a very very powerful witness of what the text should be. And they both say four years, and they date it from Gusher. So so who's changed it? Was was there an error made, and they said forty? Does somebody else think it should be forty or? Should it be from four years. It's now been four years since he came from Gush, Gusher. He's returned to establishment. This took four years for him to do this, and that's why it's, it's, it's an error in your Bible. What's the answer? Her answer is the Bible's inerrant. Well, that's not an answer. It's infallible. Infallible, period. Inerrant, period. Two different ideas, but along the same line, right? So it, is it 4 or 40? These two say 40. Why? 
What's 40 years? After 40 years of what? What's, what's the doctor say? Your wife's pointing you out, brother. I'm sorry. Yeah. So what's the obvious problem? They changed it to four years because they didn't understand their Bible. They didn't know what, they, what it was talking about. So they said, no, it must be four years. So they changed it to four, obviously. right? What's the 40? What's wrong? They don't know what date the 40's from. Right? So why, why date it from something we're not sure of the 40? Who's got the answer? You won't find it in a Bible. You won't find it in a Bible text situation. You'll find it in theology and understanding the typology of your Bible. What's the 40? 40 is an important number. Four, is Absalom over 40 years old? Oh, yeah. Yeah, at this point in time? Somewhere in that area. Is it from his birth? David's anointing? Absalom's birth. Absalom was born in Hebron. They told us that. How long has David been king now? Has he been king 40 years? He was only king 40 years total. 33 years in Jerusalem and 7 years in Hebron. So what's the 40? We know it's the number of judgment in the Bible. So is God just using a random number and picking like 40? That's that. Oh, yeah, that was the, 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 the 912th time they had Yom Kippur. And so I decided that was the day I'd start from. <laughs> huh. And it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee. Long before his exile, long before anything took place, long before his sister was raped, long before all of this, what happened 40 years ago? What is the 40-year plan that Absalom is now about to initiate? If, if, you, if you grasp the typology of your Bible, you'll start to get an understanding, right? I, I gave you the answer in the introduction to tonight's sermon. So I was deceitful. <laughs> oh. So that's a good one. That's a good one. You'll want to get that. you want to grab it. Try to figure it out, right? I have a book of problem text. If you want it, you can't borrow it. So uh, just so you know. <laughs> if you want a good book on problem text, I've, I, I've got one. I can tell you where to get it. It's, it's, it's incredible, written by a guy who was at my college, genius, and just amazing book. About, and he, he just gives you the plain answer to the Bible text. And every time people come up and say, well, there's a problem text here, he just blows them. I mean, wow, so good. Anyway, so what's the 40 years? I gave you some hints, figured out. Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay now my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. Now, um, okay, all right, get this. He, he said he made a vow. He's got to go pay it. For, the, for thy servant vowed a vow while I abode in Geshur. So when I was exiled, I vowed a vow, um, uh, and it had something to do with Hebron. So I want to go back to Hebron and pay that in Syria, saying, if the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, I will serve the Lord. Now, is this a true story? How many other stories have been true so far? <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire, hanging from a telephone wire. Yeah, he's a liar. A liar. This is just another lie. And what do we see? You ever try to stop a liar? There's no, no point in it. All right. um, why doesn't David... Does David fall for all these things? He uses religion to look good. I made a vow unto God that if God would bring me back to Jerusalem, I would serve him. And I must go and pay that vow that I gave to God. Because when I was away from Jerusalem, my heart longed to be here. So I, brought, I made a promise to God that if he brought me back here, I would fulfill a vow for him in Hebron. Oh, king, would you let me serve my God? What's he done? 
He's placed himself in the position of Moses and placed the king in the position of Pharaoh. Let me go serve my God. Let me go a, day, a few days' journey and serve my God. Can you say no? Well, I believe it's the Lord's will, Pastor. Be very careful when you bring God into anything. Don't you bring God into things unless you know. Can you imagine these people coming up and saying, I got a word from the Lord? And God says, they've spoken when I have not spoken. And now read the curse that God puts on those people. <sighs> Don't bring God up into it. You know? Don't bring God, well, God's will that I buy this car. Really? Really? It might be a smart decision. It might be a good decision. And God has given you the finances to do it. And then you want to go buy a car. Go buy a car, but don't bring God into it. <laughs> you know, you buy a lemon, it goes bad. It's God's fault, right? Because it was God's will. <laughs> Listen, stop bringing God into things, okay? And claiming the fact that you have a special revelation from God. Be careful with that. You know, you can praise the Lord, thank the Lord, give God the glory. That's all great stuff all the time. Amen. Amen. You know? But you know, I think it's the Lord's will. <laughs> you, I, you came up and said, you know, I'm not sure, but I think I have God's mind on it. I prayed about it, I studied my Bible, I asked some people. I'd be like, okay, amen, that's good, you know. But just be careful, right? I don't want to be like this guy, right? A, a pretense of religion to look good, you know. It's that businessman that wants to tell his customers he's a Christian. Why? To make himself look trustworthy. Please don't do that. That's not what your Christianity's for. The mark of a Christian's invisible, and it can be recognized by the world. When I handed Bible tract to Christians so often, you know what they said? I thought you were a Christian. That's what they should say, right? Why? Because the mark of Christianity was on you. The invisible mark of God. They didn't know what it was, but they, and now when they find out, they're like, I'm not surprised. That's how it should be, right? Well, I'm a Christian, ma'am. You can trust me. Man, if you say that, slap yourself, right? Don't use God to make yourself look trustworthy. Be trustworthy and make God look good. That, that's the way it's supposed to go. Ah, oh, oh, businessmen that try to propel Christianity. I put a, put a cross on my business truck so that way people will trust us more. And your secretary just stole $100,000 from you. <laughs> ah! Don't use God to look good. Use yourself to make God look good. Give God glory. What's that? Increase his reputation among men. How do I increase God's reputation? By making God's people look like God's people. Right? That's, what, that's why we have the things that we have. Why? To bring glory that people won't say, well, I don't want to be a Christian. Not if that's what a Christian is. Right? But if it's your good being evil spoken of, don't worry about it. Don't worry. They respect you in their heart. When they have a problem, they know who to look for. Right? Oh, I tell you, that that irks me. But you want to know what? This is the Antichrist, right? And what's he doing? He's faying religiosity and religious purposes to do what? What's, what's he proposing and what's he trying to propose to the king? Does the king know he's a liar? What did Psalm 62 say and why is it in that location? He knows what's in the heart. Hmm. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Why doesn't he, the king step in and stop all these free will decisions? It's, it's, oh. Okay. Why do I do stuff like that? I don't know. And the king said unto him, Go in peace. He arose and went to Hebron. Go in peace. Return in war. The last words David says to Absalom, go in peace. Absalom returns in war. And the king flees. Battle pursues. Tens of thousands die. The final battle, Absalom's losing. David's last command to, to his army is, don't touch the lad. I have a problem with Absalom, though. Here's, we're done for tonight. What's my final problem with Absalom? He dies as a type of Christ. Does anybody know how? Pardon? He's, he's hung by his hair. Who else gets caught and hung in a thicket by something on their head? 
the ram. He's caught in a thicket by his thorns. He's caught by his hair, hanging off the ground, hung by his hair. How many nails pierce him? Three darts pierce his body. How many nails pierce Christ? Where did they go? Where did the nails, where did the darts, I'm sorry, pierce? It says, into the heart of Absalom. And he died, hung between earth and heaven, hung by that which was his beauty, and pierced by three darts in his heart. He dies as almost a picture of Christ. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> Hmm. Does he come back again? Oh, the Bible! Anybody have figured it out yet? It's here. It's all right here. The story of redemption is completely told. One more time. Can we find it? See the woman, see the serpent all here and all the pictures and all the likenesses. Uh, it's good. Let's, let's pray. Let's go home. Lord in heaven, it's enough for tonight. Uh, we've seen enough. We've read enough. We've got our, our minds with lots of stuff that's in the scriptures, God, and uh, a little more understanding of how the book is written, uh, a little more confusion about what's here, what's not, uh, a little understanding of how to see, how to not to see. So, Lord, thank you for it. Thank you for the book. Bless us tonight as we go forth. Thank you for... Uh, Thank you for these folks, Lord, thinkers and Bible people and, and people who, who study the scriptures and, and uh, like to think and like to all of a sudden go, oh, and I, and I see light bulbs suddenly burst above somebody's head, Lord. I, thank you for that, God. Uh, we love your Bible, and we love to learn about it, and we love new things. And, Lord, uh, you feed the, the, the shepherd as, we, as, as the sheep are being fed, and, and this little shepherd's a sheep also, God, and it's awesome. And, Lord, you feed us all, you help us all, you, you, you give us all food. Thank you, Lord. As we go from this place, uh, Lord, we, we walk as sheep among wolves as we walk out of here. And certainly there, there's the wicked, and there's men that are propelling it, and they're, they're foul. And we pick on our politicians, Lord, uh, as at the same time we pray for them. But as we walk among these wolves, Lord, uh, you have the power to convert a wolf to a sheep. God, you have the strength and the power. And there's many out there, Lord, that are just hurting folks. And I pray, God, for a blessing this coming week, uh, Lord, that... Uh, in our hearts, in our minds, we'd be searching for that hurting soul. Give us Christians, Lord, uh, the boldness to speak. When we see somebody and we see a tear in an eye or we see a, a down countenance to say, hey, are you okay? Lord, I want the compassion that Christ had, not just pity. I don't want to start from an area of pride, look down on people. Lord, I want a compassion in my heart, a willingness to help to change. And God, would you give me wisdom? I pray for everybody in this church, Lord, that uh, we might be soul-hunting people this week. Why? I don't know. It's a good week to win a soul. It, it is. It's a good week to win, lead somebody to Christ. It's been so long since I watched a sinner get saved. <coughs> Lord, help us, I pray. Let us never despise the wicked. God, give us the heart of God for the unsaved. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.